Okay. So I know we have uh, a few new organizations that have uh, joined NDSA. Is anyone on the call now a new member of the infrastructure group or of NDSA itself? Hi, I am. <laughs> oh, Nicole, okay. Hi. Do you want to so introduce I, yourself? Sure. So I was actually on this committee as a member of the Library Company of Philadelphia staff. And oh. in, <laughs> in July of 2019, I changed jobs and now I'm at Vassar College and I'm head of digital scholarship and technology services. Um, and we are brand new members and we just received our membership email a couple weeks ago. Um, so I'm currently here, but I'm actually in place of a new staff member that will begin on February 15th. Uh, we have a digital preservation librarian coming in. Um, her name is Kim Gianfrancesco. So she will be participating in this group. Um, I'm, and then we also have Laura Street, our digital archivist. She'll be participating in the content group. Mm -hmm. And then I will be on the standards group. So great. But I may pop in once in a while because I've always <laughs> liked this group. So <laughs> I, I didn't think your name looked brand new. So <laughs> welcome back. Even oh, thank, today. <laughs> great, thank you. Uh, anybody else? who is new to the group or new to NDSA? Uh, so this is Robin Rugaber from UVA and I have, I'm not really new to the group, although I have been out <laughs> of being able to attend meetings for a while due to some conflicts, but I'm glad to be joining back in. Yay, it's good to see you, Robin. <laughs> uh, anyone else? Oh uh, yeah, Doug Dahl from Rattler School of Design. Uh, we joined last year. This is my first meeting, just checking to see what your folks are up to. Okay, cool. Anyone else? Hi, this is Mark Shelstead. I'm from Colorado State University, and we are also new members as of a couple weeks ago. Great. Yeah, I knew I knew we were bound to have some new people at this meeting because we 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 had a number of new organizations, so that's great. Anybody else? Okay. Um, so for those of you who are new to the meeting, um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, the notes for 2021 will all be on this same document. So now that we've got it so that you can edit it, um, we'll be using this same document for the entire year. You'll see there's also a link to the 2020 notes if you want to go back and see what we were doing most recently before this meeting. Um, and we're going to try, I'm going to try to remember, so I'm Leah Prescott, I'm from Georgetown Law Library, and um, I am a co-chair for the group along with uh, Eric Lopatin, who is not able to come to the meeting today, but he'll be at, at uh, future meetings. Um, and between the two of us, hopefully we're gonna remember to remind you to uh, add your name to the attendance list at the beginning of every meeting. We're trying to uh, keep a better um, tally of how many people are attending the meetings and such. So um, that would be great if you can remember to do that. We uh, record every meeting and um, the meetings, the recording from the last meeting is not up yet, um, but I'm hoping to do both that one and this one, you know, within a few days, we'll get both of those, both of these meetings up on a, the NDSA YouTube channel, uh, where you can go back and watch it if you were unable to attend the meeting, or if you want to just go back and uh, refresh your memory of what happened at the meeting. So uh, that's a useful uh, tool for people to have. Um, so any questions about any of that or any other sort of housekeeping type thing that I might have not remembered to tell you about? Okay, so it being the first meeting of the year, uh, we don't have a speaker. The idea that Eric and I wanted to follow through on for this meeting was to use it as a planning meeting for the rest of the year. And 
we did a little bit of that in December as well when we started this Triceter poll and um, put down topics that came up as things that people would be interested in in hearing more about. And that's the poll that I asked people to go in and, and um, vote on and lots of people did. So that's great. And we'll be looking at that in, the, in a minute. But I, before we do that, I'd like to maybe have a discussion a little bit. And this is where actually new people will have some really useful input as well as people who've been on this group probably since the beginning. Um, and that is, what it, is it that you would like to um, get out of the interest group in the coming year? What, what are your thoughts about the purpose of the interest group in terms of uh, what you need to know for the work that you're doing? Um, we've been having some discussions about uh, active versus passive kinds of meetings. Um, we've been talking a little bit about even when we have somebody who's presenting to make sure where it's possible to make to have that be a discussion as much as uh, sort of a more formal presentation. And I would love to hear from all of you about why you come to this meeting. What is it that uh, what what role does it play for you? Uh, anybody want to chime in on that? Including new people. When you joined this group, what did you, what, what was your preconception of what the, the purpose of the group is? Um, this is Andrew Diamond. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Um, I come to uh, get an idea of what sorts of technologies others are using and um, what their concerns are um, about you know, various things like fixity checking, um, types of storage, things like that. Okay. And when you say- oh, Go ahead. So, so do you do you um, is it your goal to find that out through discussion versus through uh, presentations or does it not matter? It doesn't matter. It, it can be either. You know, I I work on the technology side. I'm the lead developer for uh, AP Trust, so you know I often have a technocentric view of things. Um, and I like to keep in touch with what um, people's actual concerns are and how they're using different systems and what mm -hmm. they want out of them. Okay, great. Thanks. Chelsea, I think I cut you off. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I think I interrupted you, Leah. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, it's funny. I'm actually on the opposite side of Andrew um, in that I, I do not come from the techno side or the techno centric side. Um, I, my first meeting was in December. I'm with the new Michigan Digital Preservation Network. Um, and we're interested in, we, we don't have uh, a, a working digital preservation network up yet. Um, and so we're interested in learning about different kinds of technology and different kinds of workflows that could um, make that network a reality. Okay. Who else? Um, this is Nicole. Um, so having shifted to a different environment, I'm now in an academic environment, um, my interest would be not only the tools and storage uh, planning, but how to leverage those things in such a way that a small staff can be successful. Um, I only have a staff of four. We're not a big network. We're doing this for the, we're within the library. Um, we're, this initiative is brand new. Um, we actually wrote the press release today <laughs> for <Wow. additional> preservation. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I think staffing and keeping things 
um, workflows in such a way that they're manageable is really important and what tools can make those workflows manageable. Okay. So is there any one who has as part of their um, perspective on this interest group um, a thought of creating or um, studying, putting, uh, having an, an output uh, of some sort as opposed to, um, you know, knowledge gaining. Lee, <laughs> this is Robin. Um, Hi, Robin. One of the reasons I wanted to get back involved, not only do I enjoy like um, having presentations on new emerging things or talking with the group about things that they're doing, but also identifying common gravity points on things that are either um, a gap in the yeah. community or some kind of emerging need that then we can spin off working groups to work on. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I'm back involved. It's like, I really wanted to get glued back in and to help as well as to learn. Okay. Anyone else have any thoughts about that? I think Leah, my, my name is Nathan Gerth. I'm from the University of Nevada, Reno. And I think building off of what Robin just said, um, while I would like to say that I, that I come to meetings like this when I can, to commiserate or to, to learn more about what's going on. Sometimes it's also to just find people to work with when I'm confronted, you know, confronting rather esoteric problems that I don't have anyone to work with at my own institution because we're quite small. Mm -hmm. yeah. So an example of this would be one of the topics I voted for, which I'm not pushing right now, just as an example, the yeah. costing out um, cloud computing and, and storage, which has been a real challenge for us. And it's a very much a solo project on my end, um, it, it, it's psychologically helpful to work with other people, but I also do think that there's a deliverable that comes from that. Um, yep. Part of the reason I enjoy being part of this when I can. And and just as an aside, because you use that as your example, I can, I can commiserate in that um, when we were setting up uh, or trying to decide if we were gonna use Google Cloud Services, um, for, for our preservation material. Even the Google engineers that we were working with had a really hard time really coming to terms with what things cost. They had a really difficult time in trying to figure out, we were, we were doing something um, new with them. So that was part of it, but um, yeah, so many tiny little costs and, and how do you, how do you make sense of all that? So I, I, I would have loved as well to have someone to bounce things off of, off of commiserate with or whatever uh, when we were going through that. So I, I totally get that. Anyone else? This is Deb Verhoff. I'm just wondering if, um... SG has their hand up. Oh, I, I do actually. Thank oh, you good. for thank yeah. you for noting. Um, yes, I thank you. <laughs> I know I I use uh, my Zoom account for lots of different things, so I like to keep a little anonymous. But I'm Sarah Gentile. I'm uh, calling in. I'm also a newish uh, member of the group, and I've been a little bit of a lurker. So uh, allow me to introduce myself. I'm um, calling. I'm um, at. Uh, MoMA and uh, but I come from a library and archives background so I'm not too far afield I think from um, people within this group and uh, we are also dealing with um, some storage issues that are um, very aligned I think with lots of university partners here mm -hmm. so although we're looking at um, uh, a museum centric uh, world I think a lot of our preservation needs um, are really falling into this category. And uh, we too are kind of looking out there for 
larger solutions in cloud computing and um, you know, fixity and things that um, are really starting to were mainly established by library archives, but really we have unique um, needs, uh, I think, related uh, to our collection. And um, I'm really just trying to take um, what is my um, career background, library and archives, and really just see that I can keep one foot in each <laughs> in each community yes. and uh, and and uh, see what I can gain here. And also, again, what I can give back. You know, I think a lot of people mm -hmm. are saying that I, I wouldn't be opposed to um, giving people bright lines. Uh, I don't think anyone has um, uh, the same institutional situation, but um, I think everyone's here grappling with how are we like and unlike big industry um, and, uh, you know, how are we like and unlike one another? Uh, well, I'm really happy that you spoke up. I, before coming to the university the, at Georgetown, I was in museums. So I totally understand sort of feeling maybe sometimes overwhelmed by uh, university concerns, but the NDSA isn't just for academic institutions or university academic institutions. Uh, so welcome and, and please don't feel like your perspective uh, is any less than anybody else's. So I'm glad you're here. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? This is Deb again, I'll chime in though I did not have my hand up. I thought I should <laughs> defer to Sarah and be polite. Um, I appreciate, Leah, what you are asking us in terms of what sorts of things are, are we looking to get out of the interest groups and sort of feedback on, on um, you know, probably how they're organized or, or how the meetings run. Um, I think it could be very hard if everybody turns up and says, oh, I, you know, really want to glean from the group and then, um, you know, we, it's up to us here to figure out ways to um, do that. Um, I will say that I pop in a bit less, um, I think not at all this past year into the infrastructure group because Brenda and I are um, facilitating the content interest group and that kind of sits more squarely with my responsibilities at NYU. Um, that said, I turned up when, um, Leah, when you were speaking with somebody from Google a little yeah. while ago about your um, conversations about setting up fixity in the cloud and, mm -hmm. and I tuned in and then was able to follow up with you afterwards. What was so helpful about having an opportunity to hear from you and to connect with you through this group was that back obviously at our institution, we were having similar conversations, mm -hmm. right? Like everybody yep. Yep. got similar concerns to some degree. And we also had a person and it was a different person in a different corner of Google. And we were mm -hmm. having conversations and doing that long, hard explanation of why it matters so much to us, right? And so, yep. um, you know, so I'm, taking that example to say that for me, it was important to identify someone else who was doing something very similar and yeah. then have the offline compare notes and, um, you know, wait, are they telling you this thing? Or, you know, <laughs> what corner of your IT group are they talking to? You know, it's going to vary. Mm -hmm. um, but that type of need to know basis, I would not have known that had you not been presenting out on it. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, my feedback is we don't always need to have like a formal presentation style meeting as, you know, at the same hand. So I'm not sure how I would have connected with you had you not offered to present and bring the person from Google and have kind of a formal, you know, slides and Q&A. And, yeah. and so I think that is helpful. Um, but that other conversation that you and I had one on one, you know, everyone in, in the room might have benefited from it. So uh -huh. I guess my feedback is like, a little mixture if we if we here can figure out how that looks or how that could work some some combination of um different things would be nice yeah and honestly that's sort of the way i was feeling as well so um to not necessarily have a formal presentation every month um that um maybe a little esoteric 
sometimes for some people, but actually some topics may lend themselves to that and that's fine, but other topics may lend themselves to, just as you're describing, maybe having somebody talk a little bit about a, a topic uh, from their expertise, but then leading a discussion that might open up those channels of communication. And then also, as Robin was saying, also be potentially a place where certain activities happen that may spawn working groups. Uh, and there are a number that have happened in the past that um, we probably will, well, there's a number for NDSA as a whole. There may be one or two projects that uh, we need to check back on and perhaps update. So uh, I just wanted to find out if that was in everybody's concept, because it isn't, we didn't really do any of that last year, uh, which was the first year that I was co-chairing. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that that fit within people's perspective of what the, the purpose of the interest group is. And, and Bradley, I know you've had a lot of discussions and and thoughts about this. So if you have anything you want to add about um, this, this um, characterization of the group, feel free. Um, no, I'm good, Lee. I think that was good. Okay, good. All right. So with that sort of 30,000 foot perspective in mind, uh, we have a couple different things on the agenda to talk about. One is to look at the poll, see where that poll is. And um, if people haven't taken the poll, they can chime in on what they think are important topics. Um, and then we have this uh, matrix, which is a nascent project uh, that we could poten potentially look at as something that the interest group would have some um, role in seeing going forward. and. There's um, conversations happening about um, the role of interest groups versus the role of working groups and how do they uh, interact? How do they overlap? Um, also um, connections between the various interest groups and, and how they might feed working groups. So there's a lot of conversation uh, going on in the NDSA uh, all the way around about sort of seeing what the status of those kinds of relationships are. So um, if anybody has any thoughts about that as well, uh, love to hear it. But for now, why don't we start with the poll? If everyone has the agenda open, there should there's a link to the, to the Triceter poll. Um, and we can take a look at the topics. And there were definitely some topics that were particularly intriguing to people, 13 votes for the, the top um, topic, which is information security policies for organization and infrastructure providers. And um, one of the things that I would love to talk about is if anybody has any thoughts about who would be a good person to discuss this topic or lead a discussion about not just this, but all of the topics so that then Eric and I can work on trying to uh, get people in place to do that. So Eric is the one who put this one up. So I can't um, put him on the spot and say, did you have anybody in mind for this? But uh, does anybody have any thoughts about what, as far as this top, those people who voted for it in particular, what about this topic are you interested in knowing about? And do you have any thoughts about who would be a good person to, to discuss this or lead a discussion? Uh, this is Jeremy. Um, I... I am particularly interested in information security in general, and um, I would be more than happy to maybe co-present with someone if that's appropriate. Uh, I, I would be more than happy to speak to some of the processes that um, 
ASU has in place for kind of reviewing information security policies um, and things along those lines. Okay. So if, you know, given that you're new to this, right? You're new to the group? Yeah, this is round uh, meeting number two for me. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. So given, uh, given that, and that's a lot to ask of somebody, if there wasn't someone else who, um, you know, could co, quote unquote, I'm doing air quotes, quote unquote, present, is it something that you would be interested, you'd be willing to do where you would just introduce what you, you are doing and then, you know, open it up to discussion from, from other people so that it's not the, the pressure or the stress of, of doing a formal presentation? Is that something that you'd be willing to do? Yeah, certainly. Okay. Well, um, is there anyone else who has either done a lot of work on information security policies or knows somebody who has, who might be willing to work with Jeremy? Okay. Well, Jeremy, we, um, Eric and I will see if we can um, find some avenues for someone to to discuss this with you. But if you if if we can't find anybody, if you're willing to just sort of lead that discussion, um, and we can try to help funnel questions to you that might help to um, organize a conversation, that that would be great. Okay, sounds good. Okay, uh, so then the second highest vote getter was using open source tools for characterization. Uh, anyone out there have any thoughts about this one? Whether you yourself are using open source tools for characterization or... Um, this is uh, Terry Brady. I would love to hear what, you know, <clears throat> what kind of benefits people get from running these tools and what kinds of problems um, they've uncovered. Because it's, I, I, I remember it's been years since I've run any characterization tools, but it was, it was kind of like a, a lot of processing to essentially have the tool tell me that, you know, what I thought I was submitting was, was what it was. It was and so <laughs> it's like understanding the subtleties of, you know, uh -huh. what, what are the real problems that you solve with uh, this approach would be good to hear. Okay. Other people, any thoughts about, um, like Terry, what you would either like to know or if you um, have any connections with anybody from Jove or Droid or any anything else <laughs> uh, that we could approach. Okay. How about um, um, so fixity checking in a cloud storage environment? What problems have you uncovered by running fixity checks? So, as Deb mentioned, I uh, we've been very involved in a fixity process in the cloud. So, uh, I can definitely contribute to that conversation, um, but. And Deb, how about you? How, how have you gotten anywhere with that where you would have some thoughts about fixity checking uh, in the cloud? Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, I didn't get to implementation. Um, okay. Our conversations were with a vendor that we work closely with at Google, and there's a lot of um, uh, research technology related cloud things that we're doing. However, the storage folks who sit in a different area in the university um, are steering us to um, put our one of our copies into Amazon instead. So, you know, mine is more mm -hmm. of a managerial um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. at this point, um, you know, which is a pity because like I said, we did walk down a certain mile or two on the path of yeah. um, understanding and educating with uh, the Google reps. So um, so I don't have um, 
something, uh, I don't have a positive outcome yet from that investigation that you and I talked about last year. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is Andrew Diamond. Am I unmuted? Okay. Um, I can talk a little bit about running fixity in the cloud. Um, AP Trust does a few million fixities, fixity checks a month on files currently stored in AWS and we'll be expanding to Wasabi as well. Um, but I can talk about what we're doing and why we do it the way we do and give a little background on fixity checking in general and also tell you that about the conversations that we've had with AWS and Wasabi trying to get yeah. them to understand why yep. <laughs> um, fixity checking is important to some people. Yeah. Um, and again, like I guess it was Deb just said, um, it can be hard to make them understand uh, what our needs are. Yep, I, I was very lucky to end up getting connected with an engineer who was pretty open to and wanting to understand you know, levels of preservation and, you know, actual, um, you know, now I'm, I'm getting the phrase I want, but anyway, someone who really wanted to know that. So I, I, I feel very lucky about that. So yeah, I think that that uh, would be great. The fact that you can uh, touch on, on AWS and on Wasabi, uh, I could again give, you know, just, few minutes perspective on on our work with Google. So that sounds good to me. Okay. And and similar to my my comment before both Leah and Andrew, it'd be interesting to hear, you know, what have been like real problems that that you've uncovered? It's kind of like I know I know fixity checking is a best practice to do, but does it like what how how frequently has it, that <laughs> process actually uncovered an issue and what did recovery look like and that sort of thing yes we can definitely talk about that i mean we ran into one major problem but it was a bureaucratic problem not a technical problem so and and just the different concept of what fixity means in the cloud versus fixity on on you know, local storage that some of us are have we're used to before we went to the cloud. So yeah, we can definitely do that. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I wonder if alongside Andrew's perspective on this as a as an end user, I I do know that in the past Wasabi has come and talked uh -huh. um, different NDSA groups, and uh, I'd be curious to see if they've if their thinking has continued to evolve. Um, I, I, I hesitate to some degree to make this suggestion because sometimes that comes off as a bit of a sales pitch. Yeah. Um, and, and so I, I don't want it to be that sort of um, discussion, but you know, it, it is ob obviously true that many of these providers, you know, it's, it's, it is a challenge for them to get on the same page as, as somebody in the yeah. cloud. At the same time, I do believe that their perspective has changed in some cases. And so that might be something worth looking into. Yeah. And I, you know, I do know that it is possible to get people from these organizations to talk in a way that isn't horribly sales pitchy. Uh, if you go, if you've been to the Library of Congress's storage meeting that they usually have once a year, didn't happen in September, obviously, but they bring in um, representatives from Wasabi, Amazon, and they talk about what they do with, but they're not allowed to, how the Library of Congress actually makes sure that that doesn't happen. I'm not sure, but I could ask, um, but they're not at all a sales pitch and it's not allowed to be a sales pitch. So I think we could potentially get somebody from and Wasabi of all of the major storage providers is the least sales pitchy of all of them. So um, we can see, we can see if we can get someone. Um, OCFL adoption. Is there anybody here, Terry, I know you put this in here, but is there anybody here who's actually 
uh, the Oxford, uh, what is it? Common file Oxford layout. Common file layout. Is there anybody actually using it or involved in the organization? Lee, this is Robin. Um, the current implementation of Fedora, Fedora 6, it's about, yeah. well, we're in a pilot migration uh, test as part of a funded, grant funded project right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I would be interested to hear people's thoughts on OCFL and if they intend to adopt. Yeah. But could also talk about some of the benefits if that's of interest at some point. So if we were able to get somebody um, really involved in the group that just put out the specifications, would, you know, you'd be willing to maybe just talk about your experiences with it as an end user or well, somebody planning could, to be an end user? <laughs> I could get in, some of the main people that were involved in um, specking it out to come and oh, talk okay. to the group. Great. I'm sure they'd be willing to present. Yeah, okay. Uh, we can contact them and see if, if someone's willing to do that. Okay. Um, so evaluating environmental impact of storage in the cloud. I know this is something that uh, Linda Tadic has talked a lot about in different organizations, in different um, situations. Um, but does anybody else have any particular experience with sort of doing that kind of analysis of the environmental impact and or know of anybody who has? Because if not, I will probably, I'll, I'll contact Linda and see what she might suggest as a way to um, structure that conversation whether it's a presentation or whether it's a discussion after some basic information present, you know, making certain information available. Obviously we need to have a, a, a ground level of information about environmental impact, but then potentially have discussion. Okay. Um, so this is where we get to <laughs> uh, the cost computing uh, cost modeling of, of cloud infrastructure, which, um, as I mentioned, I have some personal experience with actually watching engineers try to figure this out. So it's something I'm definitely interested in. Um, anybody else have any particular insight or connections in this area? Has anybody here had to be part of that process where you were in our case, we had a library director who needed, who wanted, she just would not uh, commit to this as a strategy until somebody could tell her how much it was gonna cost. And I don't think she's unusual that way. Has anybody else had that kind of experience? Uh, Leah, as you might've guessed, we're in the midst of that same yeah. conversation right now. Um, I, I'd be willing if, if somebody else is able to kind of, um, to help, I, I can present some of the actual kind of figures that we've been trying to sort through after a year of using an AWS um, backed solution for our Island Door instance. Yeah. Um, especially since we've moved to in the sort of intelligent storage that they pitched EFS, mm -hmm. uh, which means that we have even less information upfront about exactly yep. the costs. Um, so I'd be willing to share some of that information if it would be helpful for people to to look at, um, though I, I wonder if, if if pairing that with somebody who's who is in actual the actual business might be useful too. Um, again, we run the risk of sales pitch sort of territory, but yeah, I can um, I can find out I can, can contact the people that I've worked with at Google, for instance, and see if they'd be willing to do that. But I also would be willing to pull together sort of how that conversation went when we were trying to do this because it was incredibly eye-opening about all of this. So, you know, I'd be happy to contribute that to the conversation as well. That, but we that can see if, yeah. Go ahead, that'd be, I think that'd be great. And, and I, I can be really 
pretty concrete to help people understand the challenges that we face because we've got yeah. the the vendor um, who in this case is behind the implementation agreed to share all of our invoices from mm -hmm. ADF. So we have a, a year plus worth of data now to work That's with. That's great. Okay. Yeah, so we can talk more about that um, when this comes up on the calendar. And that'll be the next piece of all of this is for Eric and I to start to strategize about um, calendar when this stuff happens. Um, so let's let's just look at a quickly at a few more. So next generation storage technology. These are the ones that are down here are ones that ones that have my name next to them are ones that are are uh, topics that were on the survey from last year that we didn't end up uh, having a presentation or a discussion about. So they were on the bottom of the list last year and it's interesting that they're on the bottom of the list again. So um, it definitely, there's definitely some things that <laughs> do not um, excite people to talk about. And we're getting to that point right now. So we have next generation storage technology, Microsoft Research DNA and glass storage technologies and others. This is something that I find fascinating. I know nothing about it other than what I've, you know, heard other people talk about. I don't know if anybody has any particular entree into someone who is doing this kind of work. Anybody? Okay. Uh, infrastructure training resources. Um, where can one find resources to learn more about commonly used and recently emerging technologies? Anyone there? Then there's risk management. Um, I'm just going to go through these and if we get to one that you have a particular knowledge of or interest in, speak up. So API consistency across cloud providers. Uh, geographic distribution in cloud environments. So true distribution threat zones. What does that even mean? And then the whole nines discussion, what does that actually mean when a vendor tells you we've got 10 nines and what does that mean and what that's all about? And does it actually really mean anything significant for us? Okay. Well, if you uh, have any thoughts about this, please uh, either contact me or Eric if you have, um, you come across somebody who might be able to give us some good information about any of these, that would be, that would be great. Uh, and before we run out of time, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, this matrix of preservation services criteria. Again, it's, there's a link to it on the notes page for the meeting. Um, this is a project that um, hopefully it's okay for me to, <laughs> to use your name in vain, Bradley, but this is a project that um, Bradley was involved in in the past and something that um, he thought would be useful to continue. And so this gets into that other aspect of the interest group. Um, I think one of the things that we will probably need to revisit is our cloud storage um, report that has been done by the, I'm pretty sure that was a infrastructure interest group activity in the past. So that might be something um, that will be coming up for the for the group to have some um, some work to do or input on in any case. But this is this is one and some one comment was made about this in relationship to, for instance, the the copter and the uh, power grid tool grid. And so part of 
what I wanted to find out is whether people felt like a tool that is about preservation services specifically. And if you look at the power grid, you'll see there aren't that many. There's a whole, whole, whole bunch of tools listed um, in um, combination with services. So there's, there's a lot there. Um, and whether or not it would be useful to look at a, a criteria for, for preservation services and what would be useful for organizations to have about uh, what information, yeah, to, to have about serv various services and also for this to be uh, a little bit of an overlay on top of the levels of preservation so that uh, in either direction, if somebody's looking at the levels of preservation and trying to come up with a strategy for their organization to be able to have uh, a hook into something that gives them information about uh, preservation service, you know, various services and what they provide and, and even how, how you go about even assessing a preservation service. And again, Bradley, tell me if I'm mischaracterizing this. No, let me, I'll just jump in briefly. Um, sure. Leah, and just say, you know, there is some overlap with, with copter and um you know digital power but those are much more tool oriented and workflow mm -hmm. oriented and, and tactical um the purpose of this one is to provide some overall as as leah said kind of a high level view of okay so you need to figure out what your organization's preservation solution needs to be um you're not worrying about cryoflux at this point you're not worrying about um even whether or not fixity happens at what level you're really trying to say what are my what are my what is my organization's guiding principles um and what services might be out there that align with them so it's really it's really much higher level than than all of that and this was just a first attempt we use the iso 16363 as kind of a benchmark guideline but there are other factors in there um like is there a cost model what kind of reporting do these services provide? So it's really for someone approaching the need for a service and whether or not you need to outsource a service or whether or not you're doing preservation internally. It's to help align those, those, those thoughts as opposed to how to execute specific workflows within a preservation service. That I think would be the secondary conversations after that. So it's, again, it's, it's not perfect. It's doesn't, really replace those other ones. It's um, kind of part of a, a broader picture. So I'll kind of shut up there now. No, thank you, Bradley. I know uh, that helps. So does anybody have any thoughts about this then? And, and thoughts about the interest group um, participating in uh, an analysis of this sort? Anyone opposed to the idea where you you really want to just come once a month and you know uh, have have those have the conversations and information gathering and that's uh, the extent of your uh, concept of the role of the interest group. Any anybody? Okay, well, it's something that uh, we can all um, think about um, and maybe at the next meeting, you know, put aside some time at each meeting to to move to move this either forward or to decide not to do it, but um, one thing or the other without uh, necessarily making a decision right now. Yeah, I think that's that sounds good. Um, I guess my only concern with projects like that isn't their value, which I think is pretty evident. It's the degree to which they like, if you look at the examples like copter or something like that, it's the degree to which they can quickly become outdated. And so yeah. I think any any 
work that gets applied to this, I would I would hope we could we could somehow balance that with the knowledge that this is going to need to be redone, you know, within the near future anyway. Yeah. So that it's not something where you end up devoting a ton of time to something that then you know is out of date by the time you're you're you've you're come. done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think if we can find the appropriate level, as Bradley was saying, you know, this is a sort of a high level look, so that if we're not getting horribly into the weeds, that it won't be overly cumbersome to to keep it updated. Uh, and again as I mentioned with the cloud storage um, survey, which I think is the thing that may be coming back to this interest group uh, to spearhead again, it's the same kind of thing. It's something that's been done multiple times in the past and that we just keep, you know, redoing it um, to, to keep it up to date. So, uh, yeah. I, I hear you. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Okay. Um, just double check the that that's all I had on the agenda for us to talk about today. Are there other things that anybody would like to to bring up Emily? thoughts or comments or concerns about the group, announcements of any kind? Okay, then uh, we'll finish, what, four minutes early and, and call it a day. As I said, I will be um, taking the video from this and uh, putting it up on YouTube, so can go back and refer to it if you need to. Okay. Then Thanks, please. Thanks. Yep. We'll see everybody next month. Thank you. Which Leah. um also is going to be a week later than normal because of President's Day. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>